Holy Spirit, please help us to be renewed, be revived, be corrected, directed in the ways that you want us to be in, Lord, as, as we are here in your presence. Amen. We are still in Ephesians. Our text today, we could stand up together and read, is from Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Sure, the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades. As we consider our nature, which is sinful, our actions, which are horrendous, and our destiny, which was judgment, in in verses 1 to 4, we started talking about the but God counter to our sin. Talked about God's attributes, his actions, and his aims for us. And what we have here in these verses is simply unpacking more about God's actions in Christ and raising us and seating us and uniting us to Christ. We have further explanation of God's actions of salvation. And we also have a bit more unpacking about what it means for God to be kind to us in Christ and to magnify his kindness to us. So, what does it mean for us to be united to Christ? Here is some explanation. What does it need for us to have, for God to have an eternal purpose for us to be magnifying the kindness of God in Christ? Here you have more explanation, more qualification, more fours and buts and ands, so to speak. So in order for us to understand being raised and seated in Christ, we must know this. This is the first thought about further clarifying the reality of grace in Christ, is that we are saved sola gratia and sola fide. Solely by salvation in Christ, being united to him, seated with him, raised with him, is speaking of our salvation that is entirely of grace and entirely through faith. Grace alone, through faith alone. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is important because grace is what? Grace is what we have in being united and seated and raised with Christ. What does it mean to be united and seated and raised with Christ? It is to be saved by grace. What grace? The grace that comes from Christ. And if you think this is repetitive, because Paul already said we're saved by grace, it is intentionally repetitive. You're saved by grace. You are saved by grace. You're saved by grace. You're saved by grace. Why you keep saying that? Because it is one of the most difficult things for you to regularly grasp. That your salvation is entirely of grace, and it is through faith. And it's stated as well in the perfect. When it says you have been saved by grace, the idea is that grace is something you're brought into that has ongoing and eternal effects, not a temporary opportunity, but it is a state you're brought into perpetually. And notice it is through faith alone. And notice it is through faith. You're not saved because of your faith. You're saved through faith. Faith is a bucket that receives the water that gives you life, which is grace. It simply is an instrument to give what saves you, which is grace, which is based on Christ. And notice it is through faith alone that you are saved. Not through faith in your obedience, not through faith in your affection, not through faith and covenant faithfulness. It is through faith alone that you receive grace that is in Christ. And why is it important to say this repetitively and clarify it is because any kind of salvation that is through merit of any kind in any way worded, leads to hell and judgment. Salvation by grace is not just, well, that's that's a really nice concept that I think would be helpful to me. Salvation that is not entirely of grace and only through faith leads to your eternal 
judgment and damnation. Any salvation that has anything to do with any kind of your faithfulness being the ground of it does not glorify God and does not lead to salvation. It leads simply to a bunch of prideful, insecure, self-righteous people doing dead works on their way to hell. There is no Christianity without these grace and faith alone categories. And this is why Satan attacked this teaching first. Galatians is one of the earlier letters written to the church. And notice how Paul opens Galatians. I marvel that you are so removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there are some that trouble you who would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach unto you another gospel that you have which you have preached unto them, let them be accursed. So basically, Paul says, if I preach something different than I already preached, if an angel comes down and says, oh, I got a new gospel, uh, let Paul and that angel be accursed. As he said before, and I say again, if any man preach another gospel unto which ye have received, let him be accursed. This is what the apostle Paul was killed for in some ways. This is what Jesus was threatened for. And by the way, this is what led to many of your brothers in church history to die. So when you think about talking about grace and, and, uh, and through faith alone, you're like, oh, that's nice. I like that. Do you understand that many brothers died for believing and preaching that? Do you know how many Roman Catholics kill Protestants for saying that? I can't even count them. Grace alone, through faith alone, led to people's lives being lost. It is always being attacked. It is always under assault. Even after the Reformation, you have the Arminians with their works righteousness gospel. Grace is always something, faith alone is always something that Satan will always assault, and God was always preserved. And by the way, one of the reasons why I appreciate Presbyterianism is that you can't not believe these things and be a pastor. Grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, saved by God's choice, not your, not your free will. You cannot be a pastor in the PCA if you don't believe those things. As in other denominations, you can believe that God saves sovereignly or it's cooperative. In our denomination, if you don't get grace alone, Christ alone, faith alone, you can't be leading nobody. You don't get the basics. You can't be an elder or a deacon here if you think that man's participation in any way contributes to salvation. This is the basics and the most important and the fundamentals. And it's very important because guess what? Whenever the times become how they are now, it is very easy for us to lose these important doctrines for culture war. You know what? Let's join all of the works righteousness, false gospel pseudo-Christians to change America and fight for this and fight for that. There is no Christianity when you lose grace, faith, Christ alone. There, there's nothing to fight with. If you misunderstand the very basics and essence of being right with God by grace, you're not doing any war for God. You're warring for Satan. Because God does war through the gospel, which is all of grace through faith. And you say, well, what's interesting is... <laughs> Didn't Paul say that uh, apart from Christ that we're, um, uh, you know, children of wrath uh, and we're sons of disobedience, um, we're following the devil and that our passions are all corrupt and that we're dead? Why would Paul need to say that salvation is all of grace, not works? When those works are obviously not going to save you. Who, who would think that being a Satan follower uh, and, and born in sin would save you because Paul's about to talk about good works and he wants you to understand that no kind of works, not even Christian works, save you. Amen. This is a problem in the church because many, many, like Richard Baxter would say, well, you know, we know that you can't be saved by works apart from Christ, but once grace begins to make you new, those works can 
be a part of your final justification. No works. None of them. None of them ever ground your righteousness before God. Hence why it's stated before the conversation. It's grace and faith alone. But not just grace and faith alone, but also monergism. Monergism. Notice I'm going to impact what monergism is. Monergism, one, singular. Not, not dual, not synergistic, but monergistic. Look at this. And this is not of your doing. It is the gift of God. What is this? So some people say that this is faith. By, for by grace you're fa- saved through faith. And this is the gift of God. So the gift, it's not of your doing, is, is, is faith. Others say, because they don't want salvation, they don't want faith to be a gift, they want it to be something you could actually do. They say, it's not talking about faith, it's talking about grace. That this is what? Grace. <laughs> well, here's uh, the proper way to understand it. It's both. See, grace and faith are in the feminine formulation. And this, this is in the neuter. Why is it in the neuter? Not matching one of the things. Because it is speaking back to both, generally speaking, Faith that gives you Christ is a gift of God, not from you. Grace that gives you, that faith lays hold to, is not from you. It is a gift of Christ. The Greek says that it is not from you. It is not out of you. Nothing good comes out of you or from you. It's gifted to you, including the faith that looks to Christ. It is a gift. You say, I believe, though. I believe Jesus. It is a gift that was given to you. You are believing, but it was given to you. It is not of your own doing. Faith is given to you. You had no bucket. You had no hands. You had no desire. And the Holy Spirit reconstructs you in regeneration and gives you hands and a bucket to appropriate the grace of Jesus. It's all gift. Repentance, discernment is all gifts given to you by God. You believe me right now? You believe me? Your belief is simply a gift. It's a gift. Because if it wasn't a gift, beloved, if it was coming from you, then guess what? You could wake up one day and just stop believing. But since it is not of you and from you, but it is gift, God is not, God's not an Indian giver. He's not giving you gifts of faith and taking it away. This is the gift of God is stated in the definite article. It's a way of speaking about something par excellence. So when you think about a definite article par excellence, think about this. It's not like there's many games in the year, but there was like the game, like the game that was most significant of all games, right? There are many events or parties, and there was the event. So the gift... He's saying there is something that God gives you that is distinctly gift and supreme, and it is faith. Faith is the gift of gifts. Faith is that which gives us hope. Faith enables us to obey. Faith gives us is the means to which we have assurance. Faith is the ability that enables us to suffer and dominate in the gospel. Faith is that which produces love. Faith is that which glorifies God and gives understanding. Faith is given by God as a gift, the gift. You want to know God loves you? If you want proof that he loves you, it is him giving you the most precious gift ever and it's a gift to trust him. Amen. It is the gift of God. And the best thing you could do for somebody is to bring them to embrace further that gift. And people are trusting in their own righteousness, trusting their emotions and experience, and their people pleasing, and they're trusting in their situations, their moments, they're trusting in their money, they're trusting in whatever. The best thing you could do is call them to a trust, to a faith, to a looking away from themselves to the Lord. You want to give your kids something that they need really deeply? You want to be a good husband to your wife? Give her, give them the gift of trusting. Give them the gift. It is God's chief gift. So salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone. Salvation that believes is a gift, 
a gift of God. Why salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, as a gift given to you, even the faith, it is to praise God in doxology. It is to praise God in doxology, not as a result of works. Why? So you can go to heaven? No. Salvation of grace is not so you can go to heaven. Salvation all of grace is so that you can glorify God in how you're saved and go into glory. That's the purpose. The reason that God makes salvation entirely not because of you and even your faith has nothing to do with you is because God wants no one to brag about anything. That's the purpose. So guess what? Any kind of grace that is a mixture of you and God, any kind of even faith that is because of you is because man wants to brag before God. Man wants to compete with God, and God designed salvation so that everybody would be quiet and have no grounds of boasting, but only boasting in the Lord. Let me remind you of how God sees boasting with Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel 4, all this came upon Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. And the king spake and said, It's not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of my kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. So basically, like, man, look at all this stuff I've done. While the word was in his ma- king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king, Nebuchadnezzar, to thee is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. And they shall drive you from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and he giveth to whoever, whoever, whosoever he will. You want to brag, I'll make you a cow eating grass like, a, like an insane lunatic. That's how insane it is for man to brag. And by the way, side note, it's a Gentile king being punished for blaspheming God, meaning you don't get to say you're not Israel means you, you, you still will be held consequentially judge Gentile king if you dishonor God and blaspheme him. This is not in Israel. This is in Babylon way away. Salvation is given to us so that you could not brag about anything, not brag about how much you hate sin, not, much, not brag about how much you love people. Not brag about how orthodox you are. Not brag about how little you do on Sundays. Not brag about what you're doing in your job and how smart you are. Not brag about how much you serve in the church. Not brag about your parenting. Salvation is so you will be quiet and never boast about your ethnicity and your whatever, but you would boast alone in Christ. Amen. That's what salvation by grace is about. Now, you do things that are good, but not boasting. Beloved, the purpose of salvation is that everybody would stop bragging. Wife, stop bragging to your husband about what you do in the house. Husband, stop bragging. Church member, don't brag about what you do for God. Let God make that apparent to people who see it. Be quiet, brag about who. Paul says, may it never be that I boast, except in what? The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which I was crucified to the world and the world to me. Bragging, no matter how Christian your bragging is about, offends God. It's the reason you were saved by grace is so that you would stop talking about yourself. Stop bragging about yourself. Stop pontificating and virtue healing, and that you will be humbled that God alone is the one that you brag about and virtue signal about. You were made and saved by grace so that you would be quiet about yourself and exult in God. Thus says the Lord in Jeremiah 9, Let not the wise man boast or glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understands and knoweth me. He understands and knoweth me. It's interesting. The Ephesians hearing this thing about salvation 
and being saved by God. It would echo something they would have read all over the place in the Roman Empire. Here's something they would see in Rome with this language of Savior. To the cities of Asia, along with the citizens and the nations, Gaius, Julius Caesar, son of Gaius, the high priest, imperator, and twice consul, the manifest God from Ares and Aphrodite, and universal Savior of human life. So Paul is phrasing salvation and the Savior in a way that's mocking the language of their emperor saying that he's a Savior. So it's almost like, let me give you an example of this. It's almost like someone saying, you know, black lives matter, and then, and then God comes down and says, Christ matters over everybody. It's almost like someone saying, MAGA, make America great again, and then, you know, God writes in a book, make Jesus Christ exalted again. Now, what's my point? My point is, is that God sees the things that people are celebrating and the words they use, and he's taking them and hijacking them and saying, listen, there is no person, there is no power, there is no Savior that can compete even get close to the salvation and lordship of Christ. God, in saying that Jesus is Lord and Savior, is poo-pooing and shaming any other person using that term in any other way. It is polemical. Jesus is the Savior. His grace makes the world right. Not Caesar's. Not Caesar's. So as we think about our salvation being through grace, entirely of faith, as a gift, as we think about it being so that no one would boast, but only boast in the Lord, you can kind of start thinking, all right, I guess we're good. No, we don't got to worry about works, right? None of works. As a matter of fact, if it becomes about works, then it's just because you want to brag and boast. Guess what? God is calling us away from works salvation, for the very purpose of calling us to works from salvation. That's the whole point. This doxology, this one-dimensional, one-way grace that is gifted to you is so that you will be sanctified and do good works. We will be sanctified and do good works. Understood in light of a creational thing. So God creates us. God creates us new in this cosmic sense, this creational cosmic renewal is consequential to many good things, and we should have a confidence that these works that God has created us to do cosmically and consequentially would take place. Our sanctification comes from this grace. This grace is creational, beloved, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. See, this salvation by grace is not just a concept of forgiveness in your brain. This salvation by grace is a recreating. It's a workmanship, creational act of God to reshape you and remake you in God's image. Workmanship speaks about this imagery of God forming man from the ground. Think about your salvation. Think about this grace in language that is comparable to the image of God taking dirt and forming something where there is no life and creating life. God is forming and creating and reconstructing. See, salvation is not simply just a bunch of facts about how you're forgiven. Salvation is masterful artistry and workmanship, beautiful poetic artistry of the maker. The word for workmanship is poema, where we get the word poem from. This salvation, this grace is a creational workmanship, a poetic mastery of the Lord himself. How could you ever not do good works in light of this grace being creational? You know what's interesting? is how this language of God fashioning us and working this workmanship to remake us um, goes back to the imagery of Genesis. What did Adam do when he saw God form Eve from his side? 
What is the first thing that Adam does? He breaks out in complex poetry. So poema, poetry, God fashioning. Listen, this church that is a act of sanctifying, recreating grace is poetic. It's marvelous. The IG world amazes me. You know what amazes me, the IG world? You guys are so impressed with everything you do. You know what I'm saying? Like, you do a little house project and you post it and you're like, wow, look, Marvel. Look at my new kitchen. Oh. You guys cook a meal. Oh, wow, look, my steak. Bro, if I get, if I get, another, if I get another video from Yediel about his steak, man. <laughs> Oh, look at the cake. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you walk by God's masterpiece every day and don't marvel. Beloved, the believer is God's ultimate, astounding, amazing masterpiece. You want to know God, the artist, the creator, magnify his talents? We are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus. But once you realize that salvation is nothing less than a recreating, fashioning work of God, you will get your hands off his stuff and let him do his thing with his people. You won't get in the way of his workmanship. See, when God begins to work on us, we begin to not do the things that you want us to do, that you want us to do, because we, we, we understand that we were made for God. And you'll want to get in the way of God's workmanship. Let me tell you something. If God is working on you and you're trying to get in, and someone's trying to get in the way of that, you better get your hands off God's work. He takes a lot of pride in his work. And he calls us to enjoy and participate, not compete and get in the way. See, this is important. This creational image is important because we're going to see at the end of chapter 2, is that God is still doing some construction on his masterpiece in this temple. It's this living, constructed thing that is being built up. This fashioning and built-up language over here is going to continue in the end collectively at the end of these verses. This sanctifying grace is a creational work of the master, but it's not just creational, it's cosmic so you say that all the time. Well, it's just there. Also, it's all over the place. It's cosmic. This word creation brings you back into all these imageries and phrases of Isaiah. So whenever the Bible speaks somewhere, it's already spoke somewhere else. So a lot of times, you'll hear a phrase, like, for example, like it says in John, that Jesus tabernacled amongst us. That word has a pregnant, long-term, inflated meaning beyond that word. So this new creation word has this ongoing, pregnant meaning all over the place. Let me read some verses for you um, that this phrase is connected to. In that day, Isaiah 19, 18, five cities in the land of Egypt shall speak the language of Canaan and swear to the Lord of hosts. So this is Isaiah looking to our day and saying that there are going to be nations that swear that they belong to God. And then later, speaking... It says, in that day, there shall be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria, and the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians. In that day, there shall be in Israel a third with Egypt and with Assyria, blessing in the midst of the land. Verse 25, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands. Egypt and Assyria are said to be the work of God's hands in this way comparable to us being said the work of God's hands. Isaiah 66, 22 speaks about this new creation, new heavens. By the way, when did the new creation begin to be created? According to Paul. Now, we are a new creation. The new creation is beginning now. Isaiah 66, 22, for as the new heavens and new earth which I shall make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so you are your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to the other and from one Sabbath to the other, all flesh shall come and worship me, says the Lord. 
There's one more verse being alluded here. Let me read it. It's Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65 and verse 17 says this. For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. Behold, I create Jerusalem as rejoicing and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her. The voice of crying no more shall an infinite... From there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old, but the sinner, being 100 years old, shall be a curse. They shall big, build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant, plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build another inhabit. They shall not plant another eat, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So Paul is saying that this cosmic renewal has begun in its first phase in the new creation of you, beloved. Your new creation life, which is a work of God creation, is affecting everything in life in every single way. Not perfectly, not, you know, without sin. This is why uh, a Westminster uh, folk person said, a personal experience is improved for a universal advantage. Paul is saying in this, in this phrase, that the new creation fashioning work in you is going to affect much beyond you. It'll affect marriages. It'll affect families. It'll affect cities. It'll affect nations. It'll affect everything in the whole earth. And you say, wait a second. What? God's not a wimpy creator, beloved. When God works on something... It's really, really, really profound and powerful when he works. This work of creation and being renewed is going to have many, many effects on many, many things. This private new creation life will have a broad creational effect. A creational new creation life that doesn't affect more than your individual life is not biblical new creation sanctification. It's not. Being created by the ultimate maker and fashioner affects so many things all around. So you can't see your sanctification as simply about you being saved and escaped from earth one day. Your, your new creation life literally has a cosmic interconnectedness, a domino effect. Beloved, you know what it means for you to be saved by grace? It means that you make all of life better by that new creation grace in your life. That's basic Protestant beliefs. God's recreating you in Christ has a cosmic domino effect. God's plan is not for us to be the most useless, un domino effect like people in our newness, but that this new creation work would affect and impact all of creation. So we don't just look at the world around us and think, all right, we're saved and we're recreated. Hallelujah. Praise God. That new creation work leads us to do many things in all of life and all of creation to make it better. Here's a question. Why does all the world want to cross the border? I'm not making, a, I'm not, I'm not making one of those border policies. I'm not doing that. Why does all the world want to cross into a place like ours? Why? Because cosmic new creation faith makes everything different. When it's Hinduism, Buddhism, Rome, it doesn't make anything better. Beloved, this artistry is connecting us to the massive cosmic scope and ethos of all creation. Beloved, God's artistry and beauty at work in you has massive, massive, broad implications. It is cosmic. Why? Why does it have such a far-reaching scope? Because 
all of God's grace has massive consequences, massive, comprehensive consequences. Beloved, look what it says. We are creating Christ Jesus for what? For good works. So that we should what? We should walk in them. See, you're not saved by good works, but you're saved for good works. And by the way, the reason why it's in the plural is because you're saved for a lot of good works. You were made for, and by the way, listen, this is not legalism, okay? Legalism is not embracing that you're supposed to be doing tons of good works in the name of Jesus. That's Christianity. You were made and created for good works. So when people like Thule and Tavijan say Christianity is not about good people getting better, but bad people coping with their failure to be good, it's garbage. You were made and created and fashioned for good works. To grow in good works, abound in good works, not for you to realize you constantly stink in the name of Jesus and you need forgiveness. Yes, there's some of that in Christianity, right? But you were made for good, created for good. You were wired for this. It's almost like you can't use a knife to comb somebody's hair. It's not in its design. Christian, you were designed that the grace of Jesus, apart from your works, would consequentially cause comprehensive goodness and good works all over. (laughs) And I love how it says you're made for good works, not talking about good works. Beloved, you weren't made to talk about good works. So much Christianity oftentimes is just talking about doing something never-endingly and never doing anything, just talking about doing good works. You were made to do good works, not endlessly talk about good works. <laughs> so this is why Paul says in Galatians 6, as you have, there are, have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. This sounds like such a, don't we know this? No, we don't. In the reform world, I've literally heard things say like this. The Christian life is not in the imperative. It's essentially in the indicative. That's code word for Christianity is just you believe stuff, not you do stuff. I literally, I mean, I'm talking about like pastors, reformed pastors, saying that Christianity is not essentially about behavior. It's about beliefs. No. It's about beliefs and behavior. Believing in salvation by grace, through faith, not from works, for good behaviors, good works. You should be committed to good works because you were made for them. And it's important to understand we're made for the good works that God told us were good works. Okay? Um, Westminster Confession 16.1 says, good works are only such as God has commanded in his holy word. Okay? The good works that God has, has prepared for you are not whatever you think in your good intentions is good. There's a lot of that junk in the church, bro. My intention, no, it, it doesn't, is it, is it God's actual good described work? Is it according to his law? Okay? God alone, 22 says of the Westminster Confession, is the Lord of the conscience and has left it free from the doctrines and commandments of men. The good that God is calling us to is the good that he's told us is good. So, for example, you know, spending uh, half of your week not eating because you feel bad about your sins. God never told you to do that. God never told you to go walk on your knees up up a thousand stairs. Like, there's so many things that men preoccupy themselves with that has nothing to do with good works. And remember, beloved, when you insult people, you weren't made for insulting each other. You were made for good works. Ladies, you, ladies who, who tend to be more prone to gossip, you weren't made for gossip. When you gossip, you never, I wasn't made for that. When you talk filthy and joke filthy, remember, you weren't made for that. You were not made for that. You were made for good works. <laughs> when you see yourself as a person who's always in some fight and some quarrel, you were made for good works. 
When you're tempted, when you're tempted to go home, spend the rest of your evening on the phone or on your TV, doing no good for nobody in your house, remember what you were made for. When you're too tired to do good works because you trash your body and you're, you're hungover, remember, beloved, you were made for good works. Not getting over hangovers. Not being too tired. I remember I used to go, people, Pastor Otto, what, why do you, why you care about, you know, eating right and, and health? Because when I would come home, I had nothing for nobody. Come home, you know what I'm talking about? Come home after eight hours of work, boom, you're done. I was made for good works. Amen. Not for collapsing because I'm constantly mistreating myself and I have no energy to love people with good works. I was made for good works. Amen. When my wife has a bad day and she says something not nice to me and I want to go back and retract and be evil, remember, I was made for good. Amen. I was made for good works, not shade for shade. When young men want to be tempted, the Christianity is about getting together with your friends to smoke cigars and have cognac and do nothing to love the body of Christ. Remember, you weren't made to talk about the Reformation and not be those who are known, notorious for good works. You weren't made to talk about good works, but to do them, many of them, walk in them. In the same way you walked every step of your life in filth, this new creation grace, this fashioning is for you to walk all over the place for good works. Amen. You walk in this. You live in this. This is important because Christians tend to have this weird view of what it means to do good works. You know? You, uh, it's like the guy who leads something in church but does no good works with his family, and he's the most obnoxious husband, but he does good works in the church. No, you were made to walk all your life in good works, okay? Or it's the person who likes to do good works in the church, but everyone in the world thinks you're a jerk. But you're really good in the church in these little segments. Listen, you were made to walk everywhere in godliness, The lady who is off to her husband and she wants to be a, a woman's leader for, for Bible studies. No, you were made by God and fashioned for walking good everywhere. Not this segmented piety, you know. Oh, I like to go volunteer for the poor, go do my, you know, kitchen soups up and live like a heathen. No, you were made to live all of your life. Walking in the beautiful mastery of your refashioning in Christ. You were made for this. You can't sit over and say, oh, I'm just a kid. You were made for this. Like, I don't feel like I was. You were made for this. God made you for good works. Not talking about them, but doing them. This is my last thought. We can, we can be very confident in this reality. We can be very confident. Why? Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. So everyone, everyone in, the, in the reform world, what's reform? It's, 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 you know, it's the kind of church we're part of. They all like talk about election, right? Let you're elected sovereignly by God, not by your doing, but God's doing. Your faith not come from you. Like, everyone loves talking about that. But guess what? You were elected not just to believe apart from your ability to believe. You were elected and predestined for good works. God's decree is not just about getting you saved. It's about walking in good works. So think about this. Lord, what's your will for me today? What's your predestinated will for me today? I, 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 do good. <laughs> do good. What's the will of God for my life? Let me go around to all the weird prophets in Miami. Que la voluntad de Dios para mi vida. B 
Be good. Do good. That's it? Yes. Do lots of good in light of the immeasurable kindness and goodness of Christ. You were predestined and decreed not for feeling good, but doing good. Not getting your way, but doing good things. You are predestined for good works. I just remember I had one of those days in my house where just, I don't know, I was the bad guy that day. And I was tempted to be, I'm going to, you know what, I'm going to make this, I'm going to make them feel my anger today. Y'all laughing because y'all do this stuff all the time. And I remember I was predestined for good. God has decreed that I would not be the whiny, pathetic victim, but to be good in my house. Who are you talking to? I'm talking to me. Predestined for good. Doing good. And what happens a lot of times, beloved, I'll, I'll close here, is that we tend to be legalistic about what kind of good that we're better at doing than others. So I'm saying, so some of you are better at speaking to do good works, right? And some of you are better at serving with your hands. That's, that's Peter's, this, this, and, this. and like, you're like, you look at the people that spend their life just using words to do good to people and encourage people, and you're like, those people are just lazy. And then you who have the ability to do good much with your words, you look at people that don't even like to use their words, but just serve, and you're like, oh, those people, they're, they're superficial. Listen, God called you to be about the good works that you're gifted in doing, not to make your good works that you're better at the law by which you measure all people. So some people, you're really good with younger people, right? And some people, you're really good at doing good works with older people. That's fine. That's fine. But I've noticed in the church, if you have a particular good gifting, you walk around always bothered by people not being about the good you're about, even though they're about good things. It's not just, it's not, it's not just your good things. Some of you are better at being comforting, and some of you are better at being correcting. And the corrector or the comforter wants to always look at themselves as being supreme and superior. But, beloved, the Bible says that we all should be about good works. And if you're doing good works, wherever you're most gifted in doing good works, you should not be legalistic about where you're gifted in doing good works. This is important for homes because people oftentimes are good at different things and you're constantly competing with each other about the good works that you are particularly gifted in. I call this... The homosexual spirituality. What do you mean by that? What is homosexuality? You're in love with yourself so much that you refuse to see someone different than you as being a good thing, but you have to constantly just be in love with yourself with someone that's just like yourself, their gender. This is a problem in the church. We're so in love with ourselves, they want to make everybody like us in goodness. But here's the beautiful thing in Ephesians. The diversity of goodness and good works that isn't competitive but complementary. If God, beloved, is making us for good works, predestining us for good works, you better be sure that Satan will be countering this all the time. All the time. You know, you know, you know, he'll say, "Don't worry about doing good; someone else will do it." That person, you know, they have, they're struggling. Don't worry. Someone else will do it. Don't worry about doing good because God's sovereign. Don't worry about doing good in the world because, you know what, the whole world's going to sink anyway. So just, that's how Satan talks to the people of God. He will always find a reason why doing good is not the good to do. You know what I'm saying? There's always, or... Don't worry about doing good because those people that talk about doing good, they're legalists that are not preaching the gospel. Don't worry about doing good because if you do too much good and focus on too much, too much good, people are actually going to uh, not like Christianity too much. So the more Christians are about good works, so guess what? 
Is it, good, is, it, is, it, is it a good work to not kill your kids? Simple question. Is it a good work to not kill your kids? So what does the devil do? Christians are very passionate about people not killing their kids, and Christians come up to us and say, if you really want to win the people, don't be about the good of not killing kids. <laughs> Beloved, the more we're obsessed with good things, the more we love good, we're passionate about good, we're doing good, the better it is for God's kingdom and everyone. Because we were made for good works. So this week, I want you to look at your life and tell me, are you operating in accordance to your desire, your design, and your wiring. Okay? If you're not, remember what you were made for, and remember what grounds your ability to do good. It is being saved by grace, united, raised, and seated with Christ. You were made for good in all of grace. Let me pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for the wonderful truth that none of our works have nothing to do with why we are right with you, why we are justified and a part of your family. And we thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that that reality compels us, calls us, creates us, fashions us, moves us, drives us to do good works. Lord, I pray that the grace that we are hearing about and singing about, I pray that the meal of grace that we're going to partake in, that would propel us to many good works. I pray, Lord God, that every man here would go tired every night because of good works. I pray, Lord God, that those of us who are weary for doing good works, that we would understand that that was what we were made for. We were made to exhaust ourselves in doing good. Lord, I pray that those who doubt their ability to do good works, they will remember that this day they were reminded that they were created and predestined for good works. Lord God, I pray that the grace that we are enjoying here would make us eager to do good works. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.